All right, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am Captain Nathan Flack, a current student at the Air Force Institute of Technology. I'm doing research on multi-domain operations education. Uh, so I'm here as a research student uh, collecting data over at ECSC, uh, but also have the chance to present uh, some of the data or some of the, the research that I'm doing and uh, to get feedback uh, from you all. So this will be a pretty uh, informal uh, uh, presentation and I invite you to um, throw out questions or comments um, as we go here. And really, um, what, what I want to get at is how are we thinking about teaching multi-domain operations? What does that look like? And what, what ideas um, are, are out there for really engaging people on this topic? So, uh, who uh, here knows about Ender's Game? Yeah, got some, got, we got lots of hands. Okay, so, you know, basic story, Ender's Game, he uses, um, they, the military at the time, um, they use games to teach their students almost exclusively. Um, they're in, in a classroom environment, in a military training environment, but they're using games. So, um, you know, what, is, what does that mean for the military? It was interesting, this, this article, if you go out uh, and look it up, uh, the CHIPS article, it talks about the military strategy of Ender's Game. And back in the 90s, uh, they would have uh, Marine lieutenants and captains read uh, Ender's Game to pull out some of those um, military strategy type of things. And, and this is actually something the military's been doing for a long time. We've been using games uh, to train people. So here's, uh, if you can see, here's some airplane spotter cards. So this is not the uh, World War II edition, but they would have, they would, they would distribute these cards in, uh, in World War II. Um, they were just basic playing cards, but on them were the outlines of airplanes. So you would, as you were playing, you would learn what the Allied and Axis airplanes looked like from the front, from the side, from the back. So a way to use cards, a game, to, to train military, military folks. Also ran across this one recently. This is uh, Art of War, so uh, that, that book turned into a card game. Um, it's also, it's just a basic, you know, deck of cards um, with your different suits, um, but it has uh, some military strategies on there. Um, so, so interesting, we've been using cards uh, to train people. So this, this, this talk is about um, interactive learning tools um, in, in Air Force education and training. Um, so um, I'll kind of explain some of my research and also talk about a product that we've put together um, at, at AFID. So here's some background. So one thing um, that we're working on right now at the Air Force Institute of Technology, when I got there last August, um, was this thing called Cyber Education Hub. And essentially, um, this is a cloud-developed platform where um, people at the lowest levels of our Air Force and DOD can contribute to the content that's out there that's, that, that's, um, that we're, we're training on so, um, and educating people on. So essentially, um, it's, it's, it's kind of like a YouTube or a Netflix, but where anybody can contribute and anybody can consume content and it creates uh, social networks around what we're, what we're learning and what we're training. Um, so that was, that was something that they were, they were focused on a lot when I got there. Uh, but one of the things they were looking for is, okay, we've got this, we're, we're gonna have uh, this great uh, platform where people are gonna be, but what kind of interactive, uh, hands-on, as much as you can be hands-on with a computer, but what kind of interactive training and education tools are we gonna be able to place on this and integrate into this platform? Then at the same time, you have what's going on over at ATC with the continu Continuum of Learning Initiative, and they're, um, um, not going to remember the name right now, but essentially their learning ecosystem that they're putting together. And they're trying to make you know, this, this ecosystem that has all of these apps plugged in. Um, as, I, as I dug more, they're really, they're, there's not a whole lot of um, apps that they have right now. They're kind of laying the foundations and looking forward to that, but what are we going to put in that? And then at the same time, there's a lot of this talk about MDO. Um, one of the big things, obviously, conferences like this um, and the, the chief of staff of, of our Air Force and then also on the Army side talking about multi-domain multi battle, multi-domain operations, and multi-domain command and control. Um, so, try to build a research project that took all of these things into account. So, first of all, when you talk about educating, 
uh, in, in training on multi-domain operations. We have to define what it is. So I went to a conference in Europe, uh, the European uh, Cyber Warfare and Security Conference. Um, these are some of the same slides that I shared there, but I had to get really basic um, with, with the research students there as an academic conference about what is multi-domain operations. And that's kind of where uh, some of this comes together. Uh, but the goal, really, is to, that the Air Force is looking at, is mastering that multi-domain command and control. And um, we'll, I'm going to have, have a few quotes that's going to get at that. Um, but kind of, you know, this might be some, something we look at and be like, okay, it's, it's all of these domains connected together. But in fact, it really turns into all of these domains connected to every other domain. And that's where you get a lot of the complexity. So when we think about training and education, how do we simplify this for students so that they can, uh, they can start to, to uh, grasp these concepts? So uh, when the Chief of Staff, uh, um, General Goldfein, came into office, he sent out uh, a focus area. Uh, he sent out his three focused areas. The third one was multi-domain command control. And these were some of the quotes that he gave. Um, so the, the ones in bold there. So he's talking about military capabilities working in concert across all domains. And he really pounded home that we need a new way of thinking and a new way of training. Then he followed that up with the MDC2 implementation plan um, that, was, that was signed by uh, our three top leaders. And it really focused on interoperability, but also hands-on training and education, giving everybody, giving as many people in the Air Force um, hands-on learning in multi-domain operations, multi-domain command and control. So trying to, to bring all that together, what are some of the challenges um, that are, you know, for multi-domain operations in, in, educate, in educating an entire force in it. So three, you know, these six things, I'm sure you all could probably come up with more or come up with this exact same list. There's a lot of um, complexity to it, um, and then things are constantly changing. You're trying to take cultures and um, knowledge across different uh, domains as well as different services and try to integrate that together. And uh, obviously General, General Golfing has been talking about this a lot, but he really sees it as we don't need a new technology um, to make this happen. We need a new app, right? It's, it's gonna be the applications that connect all of these shooters and sensors um, in, uh, across those domains that are gonna, that are gonna make this happen. So thinking about this, where are the gaps today? So I see so you kind of three gaps um, that, I've, that, I've, that I've put into this. So kind of lack of understanding of MDO, at least it's hard to come to a definition of MDO that kind of everybody can agree, of, agree upon and, and gather around. Um, availability of collaborative and interactive training tools. That's kind of a gap where we're, we're moving towards filling those holes in more areas than just, just this, but um, that's, that's definitely still a gap. And then personnel are over, overloaded with training. You know, I've heard death by PowerPoint, right? So how do you cut through all of the all of the training that's out there to really engage people and get them to think about this topic? So what's the need? Uh, we need uh, more learning tools to engage our personnel. We need experiential learning that's going to um, make make people put these ideas and concepts in their own words so that they can they can understand it and they can express that to others. And then. Um, resources that are ready to be integrated. So the, the big thing about the MDC2 implementation plan was that it tagged ATC and they said, hey, you need to start integrating MDO education into all of your current courses. Now, it didn't say all of them, but it's starting, starting at what we already have out there today, integrate MDO there. So how do you do that? How do you go to an instructor who's already you know, overtasked yeah. and doesn't have enough time and say, okay, now integrate MDO. They have to go out and do the learning. Uh, they have to read it, read for themselves. So how can we build a tool that somebody can take, integrate into their cl classroom in an efficient way? So here's a pr proposed solution. So to build a serious game uh, to bring these concepts together. 
So both an experiential learning in the classroom and something that's, that can be integrated by instructors at, at various levels. Serious games, uh, there's a lot of research out there in the commercial world about them. It's been a, a growing area of research in the last about 40 years. So they provide hands-on learning, uh, they engage personnel, and um, they build long-term competency is what we've been seeing from the research. So we wanted to take that and build a serious game that would use uh, all the different war fighting domains and integrate them together in a way that a student can take and, and um, to use in a classroom environment. We really wanted to paint the big picture so people start seeing how these little uh, things connect together. Relatively, relatively easy to learn in a classroom. As you'll see, um, you'll probably get the, get the idea that uh, the game we ended up building ended up being very complicated. And that's one of the big um, pushbacks or critiques we get about the game. But um, I would say I'm, I'm very much open to suggestions about how to get after integrating six domains together in a, in a game that's not complicated. So if you have any ideas, please let me know. All right, so um, you see the, the, the Venn diagram on the right. We're going to spend some time in that because where do serious games fit in our world today? So you'll see the Venn diagram, learning, games, and simulations. So games, you know, think of StarCraft II or Settlers of Catan or, you know, throw out your favorite uh, video game or board game. Um, so, you, you know, as, a, as I'm going, maybe start to fill in your head examples of what you see, what you see out here. Obviously, learning, it's going to be very much classroom instruction. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of different um, types of learning, but, but, you know, that's a big one. Simulation and getting into the simulation games a little bit would be like a flight simulator. So you have those that very much are on the game side of that spectrum, very much on the, the training uh, real to life side of that spectrum, especially when you bring in VR and some of those other capabilities. Here's one that's more toward the training and exercises, a, a command modern air naval operations, if anyone's heard of that. Um, very much tries to integrate in a computer game or real world uh, military capabilities. There in the, in the middle between learning and simulation would be war games. Um, Bogsat, who's heard of a Bogsat? Oh, I got one, a bunch of guys sitting around a table, right? So, you know, you have a bunch of people in a room, you know, think of your tabletop exercises that are, are playing out a scenario and trying to think of the, um, the uh, you know, different, different actions an enemy or a, or a friendly force could take. Over on the other side, between learning and games, you have edutainment. Um, kind of a new, new word that came out in the last 10 years. So I think of where in the world is Carmen San Diego, but you know, you're thinking at edutainment, uh, it's, it's entertaining game, but also has some real world learning uh, built into it. And then serious games kind of sits there in the middle. Um, and I wanted to share it, fold it, um, if, if, if you've heard about that. It's a, it's a, it's a game that's real, a real world protein folding. Uh, so um, fold it came out in 2008. Three years after its release, players of the online puzzle game Fold It helped decipher the crystal structure of the Mason Pfizer monkey virus, an AIDS-causing virus. Although the solution had troubled medical science for the preceding 15 years, the combined effort of thousands of players produced an accurate model of the enzyme in only 10 days. So they turned this um, problem that they had of, hey, we need to figure out how these proteins and enzymes fold together to, um, and, and I'm not a microbiologist or, or anything like that, but they built it into a game so they could spread out that, uh, the brain power that it took to do this and made it in a fun, in a fun way and an engaging way that people want to spend time figuring this out. So we built a uh, collectible card game. And some of the things that kind of got us to the collectible card game was it has the ability, you have different cards in, in the game we built. One version has 57 cards. Um, this version um, that, that's up here has 40, 40 uh, or 54 cards. But you can take one military capability or one, one capability, distill it down to a card. You know, I've got a picture and some things and I'm gonna pass around the cards here in a minute so you can kind of see what they look like. And then you can, you can put some traits, you can put some ideas about how that card interacts with the environment around it. 
And then you can bring in another card that does the same thing, distills a capability down into its essential form and kind of outlines a way that it interacts with other cards. And then when you keep on adding more, then you're building this environment that now you have to think about, okay, there's this one capability. How does adding this, or how does using this in a way um, work itself out and affect that environment? And that's why we focused in on this uh, collectible card game. And they're actually very popular. So Hearthstone might be one that you've heard of. It's an app or a, a computer game. And you probably can't see the numbers, the numbers in the back, but um, one point, uh, you know, 1.5 million um, reviews and you know, four, four and a half stars. Uh, UGO is another one uh, that's very popular. That one's got you know, 1.7 uh, million reviews and it's almost got at five stars. So it, it, a lot of popularity. Pokemon might be another one. Um, last year, or in, um, yeah, so it would, it would have been 2018, there were 2.1 billion Pokemon cards sold world, worldwide. So this is a very uh, popular type of game and so we wanted to leverage that um, and match it up with the military capabilities. So we built uh, the game called Battle Space Decks. So I'm going to pass a, a, few, a few of the decks of cards around. So the game was actually... Uh, the game was built by... Um, Colonel Alan Lin, who is an instructor at Appet. Um, he's, he's since moved on, um, doing some other things. And he was actually gone before I got to Appet, but I picked up his game that he, that he developed and um, tweaked, tweaked his rule set and tried to engineer it to be able to work in a classroom environment. And that's where Battle Space Next came from. So it seeks to integrate um, cards, capabilities from all these different domains. So we, um, we included some electro electronic warfare capabilities, as you'll see, also information operations, um, and then we focused on the cyber side of um, the game. And really that cyber, cyber integration piece is where um, I think we get a lot of value out of this game. So this game is coming out of the Center for Cyberspace Research at the Air Force Institute of Technology. So we were really interested in that cyber education side of the game. So what we did is we took uh, the cyber kill chain um, from, um, you know, the, it's pretty commonly known out there, I'm trying to remember the, the Lockheed Martin, I believe, was the, the first one to, to come out with it. But distilled that down into some basic steps. So you've got your scanning, scanning and uh, reconnaissance, then you've got your gaining access, and then you have your exploits and attacks. And so we tried to keep, come up with a real world capabilities like Nmap and like uh, di distributed denial of service, firewalls, root kits, and try to put those in that construct to help, help students learn that. Here's some of the lesson objectives that we've, we've put together for this game. And you, you can kind of read through those. Um, this would be something that an educator, uh, somebody who's, who's doing a class right now is gonna be very interested. They're looking at, at different training resources out there and, how can I use that to meet my requirements of what I need to teach my students? I think a big one, um, and it goes back to game theory, is the um, anticipating, adapting, and responding uh, to an enemy or to your environment. Um, and I think that's, that's um, a, a takeaway from the game that we're already seeing and some of the preliminary data we've been able to, to gather. So really, the game is about integrating hands-on MDO training and education into whatever military environment would have a need for that. So this kind of gets into the research side of it. Um, I'll go through these pretty quick just because it's not too relevant to, to you, relevant to me right now and my advisors and things like that. So um, trying to get at the efficiency, that's like the integration piece into a classroom, and the effectiveness, that's how the students are perceived receiving it. So if they're engaged, if they're having fun, if they're learning, that's, that's good. That's, that's, that's really good over here. But for the instructor side, does this meet my requirements? Does it fulfill my learning objectives? And how much time is it going to, and energy and effort and money is it going to take to get this, get this thing, whatever it is, could be, might not be a game, and get it into my classroom. 
So I'm doing a human subjects research experiment. Um, we've, uh, you'll see on the next slide, we've run it through um, several different organizations already. Like I said, I'm here at um, Air Command and Staff College with their multi-domain operational strategist program, their MDOS uh, program over there with Dr. Jeff Riley, who presented at the conference yesterday, um, really getting his students' feedback on the game to, to improve it, but also to see how it's performing in the classroom. So here's some of the different engagements that we've um, had with the game. Um, been getting some good feedback. Um, we've had, uh, I think I've put together probably about four different versions of the game now. And I'm guessing the version that's being passed around is probably not the final one. Uh, but but different versions of the game have gone through different organizations. So, an exciting one is north towards the bottom. The newest career field in the Air Force, well, at least at the time, was the 13 Oscars, which is the multi-domain command and control uh, career field. Uh, so these uh, got to got to go down in their first month of their very first course to their initial skills training and and run them through the game and uh, collect some data. And they they had some fun with it. They had some good good critiques. Uh, they they uh, found some mistakes on the cards that that only you know a 13 Oscar would find. So it was good. So here's some of the um, environments that have already targeted have already been targeted with the game, um, and some other potential ones. Um, and so part of this presentation might be, hey, there's this you know research going on at Happit, and maybe you want to leverage that or take advantage of it in your environment. Um, so thinking you know you might not be in a military classroom. But um, what about uh, unit training? Is there a need for your, you know, the people that you work with, the people that you lead, to have MDO, have MDO experience? Maybe you bring in a game like this, and you can actually, um, you know, it's kind of a fun thing. You don't, you know, just just kind of have people go and do it, but then in in the end, bring out the discussion points that are really important to you. So I'm a, you know, I'm a poor researcher. So I'm, I'm looking for other environments to run this experiment to collect data. So if that interests you, I would love to, to talk afterwards. And here's some of the resources that we're building, putting together at AppIt to make it integratable into um, other, other environments. So you know, instructor's guide is gonna give um, you know, readings, you know, a, a, my reading list essentially uh, for MDO and what I've been able to, to find and put together and leverage from other people along with you know, videos and how to integrate this into a classroom, maybe some example debrief um, discussion questions to have afterwards, things like that that's gonna help uh, somebody take this and plug and play into, into their classroom. Here's some of the research efforts that are ongoing. So short term right now, we're working on a digital game. Um, so taking the card game and putting it into a digital environment that um, has slowed down over the past couple months, unfortunately. Um, just with um, changing, changing priorities and things like that. Uh, but I think there's a lot of potential there uh, for taking this because you are able to reach a lot more people, especially as we move more towards the continu continuum of learning environment. You're gonna have people that are sitting at a computer away from other students. Um, this would be a way for them to, um, to, to engage with the game as well. And then long term, I think there's a lot of um, potential uh, for a game like this. Um, and you, you know, I think training on the electromagnetic spectrum and how that influences military operations, I think there's a lot there that we haven't explored yet. We get to the cyber, cyber piece of that, uh, but as General Holmes pointed out, there's this other thing over here called EMS that we really need to start figuring out. And might it be more the umbrella term um, for cyber operations? So more exploration of that. And I think a game could be, could be a good way to attack that. With, with regard to the digital game, I was hoping so, uh, but maybe maybe it might be you know a year two year and a half, and it might depend on the next student class at Affit if anybody picks it up and carries carries the baton from what what I've been able to put together. Um, I'll show you um, in the next couple slides um, the um, the digital game as as kind of we've designed it and are putting it together now. We have very very rudimentary cards moving around on the screen, but that's about it. Also, when you're um, you know looking at a game, you could play an AI engine, so you have a, an actual like computer player that you can play against. But then also, you know, you can have AI on AI. There's a really really interesting uh, video out there about StarCraft II and an AI that they built to play StarCraft II. 
And that kind of opens up a world of um, possibilities when you're looking at military training and how, how, are, we, um, how are we helping decision makers um, and strategists and planners uh, to do this the best way. So here's um, a, an initial design of what the um, digital game could look like. So you kind of have your, your hand down there at the bottom, and then you have your, your playing area where you're, where you're playing different cards, um, and then, then other labels of things. Um, it's a little hard to, you know, there's a lot going on in the screen for you know, a crowd that doesn't know um, a whole lot about the, uh, about the game and how to play. All right, so in conclusion, we looked at some of the background, uh, foundation of the, of the game, gap analysis, and our proposed solution. And then we got into how, how we're going to answer this, these questions about efficiency and effectiveness. And, we, and then, we, then we launched into the future, uh, future research. Uh, so I appreciate uh, you all coming out. I'm not going to uh, keep anybody around too much longer, because I know this is the last presentation of the day. So I'm sure there's you know, some things that you're all looking forward to getting to tonight. Um, but I've got my um, email up there. I welcome any, uh, any feedback now or later on through email. And uh, I know some people have been asking about how do we get this game, things like that. So I would love to um, keep, a, keep a discussion going with you. So I'll open it up now for questions. Um, <clears throat> yes, sir. So the, the card game, the cards, uh, are they available to anybody who would like to use them or can get them? Do we contact you for that? How do we? Yeah, so we've got like 30 sets of the, of the cards right now that I'm kind of taking around and doing research with. Okay. So that could be one avenue we could get interaction with the cards. But then also they're, they're uh, PA approved, and so we can actually take them to commercial printers, um, and we can, we can work on that. So I could, I could, it could, we could work out something where I can get you the card files, and then you can take them to whatever printer you would want to, in, order, or in order to print those off. The, we ordered um, 30 decks of cards, um, each one has 54 cards, and it came out to about $10 a deck. Um, so pretty reasonable if you were looking at ordering a lot for a squadron. And I guess included with the cards, there are some kind of instructions or yes. something that makes instructors guide us through the whole process. Exactly, yeah. So it's definitely still in flux, because as I'm, as I'm doing my experiments, I'm learning more about actually how to do it. Um, but we do, there's like a very complete instruction guide for how to play the game. Um, I can you know, I can provide you with today if you if you wanted it. Mm -hmm. Good. Further questions. How long did you work with Tom Ryan? Uh, so I got to meet uh, Dr. Dr. Riley at the MBO working group that we had at Pathet, right. and then we kind of had a, a back and forth about using the game in, in his in his classroom. So it's only been uh, probably about five or six months now. Uh, been aware. And I actually before I met him, got to read some of his articles on Over the Horizon which is a great resource uh, for MBO uh, education. Yes, ma'am. Did you um, do any research on the um, modeling that's done in Red Flag? No, I didn't. Um, I'm not aware, aware of that. Okay, okay. Even though, uh, I'm assuming it's modeling and simulation, maybe modeling through like the air, air Warfare Center or something like that. Okay, good, thank you. Okay. Be great. Um, that's one thing I'm working on exploring as I go to now write all this down for a thesis. Is um, the, the the I think there's a lot of um, evaluation that that has been going on in the war games and simulation um, and trying to trying to pull the goodness out of it. Anything else? Does the game currently only have American assets? Uh, yeah, good question. So it's all, yeah, it's all uh, U.S. military assets. Um, not because we couldn't do, we couldn't do other things. There is, um, there's kind of a uh, requirement, but we'd like to keep it at the unclassed level um, and publicly releasable level because that gives us a lot more um, ways to get in, especially when you think about recruiting, ROTC, some of those um, environments that could really benefit from a game like this, we want to keep it at that level. But if we're taking it to a different level, I think at a, at a publicly releasable, you could have some um, you know, enemy assets, have a card deck that's actually modeling the, the enemy. But um, actually from our senior leaders, it's kind of been more like, that's kind of an aggressor squadron type of role. We actually want the, the, the per common person out there to be more thinking about our, our capabilities and how to leverage those. So that was, that was interesting to hear. Good question, yeah. 
and you can take this to the, to the TS level if you want. It's just today I, I build cards with a PowerPoint file. So you take the PowerPoint file, it's got the templates in there, you type up, type up the different things, put the card parameters in there, and you've got a card that's, that's ready to go to the printers. So um, there'd, be, there'd be a lot of possibilities there. You're thinking, who's going to print it? Yeah. So, yeah. you know what? I, I actually, um, early, on, early on in my development, I print out paper copies, cut them up, you know, do my little arts and crafts thing. And then they make, you know, the gaming world is great. They make these little card sleeves, and you just tuck them in there, and you can play with the card sleeves. So there's nothing, you know, commercial printing, that doesn't, that doesn't stop us from using this in a, you know, in a uh, environment that might not be, uh, you know, publicly releasable. As far as ideal audience that you were doing some of your research, mm -hmm. uh, what's your recommended group? Yeah, so um, I've gone done ROTC cadets, so sophomores and juniors in college, all the way up to multi-domain strategists and the 13 Oscar curriculum. So that's a pretty wide range. I think as we're seeing the game, the part of the research is to, okay, where's going to be the best place? And I think ROTC, OTS, um, and maybe SOS, um, the, the um, junior captains, um, kind of level because you're starting you want people to kind of think of the big picture and anybody can take the cards and kind of look through the cards and it would be a learning experience for them but you know who who you know would actually be able to engage with the strategy part of the game which is that higher level learning on the blooms uh, pyramid yes sir uh, have you ever thought or considered coming down to the 39th OS schoolhouse where we teach IQT for all the weapon systems and cyber yeah, so haven't, I haven't made a specific connection with that, but there's actually been some connections with Keesler Air Force Base and some of the training squadrons there. So later on, um, next quarter, hopefully going down to undergraduate cyber training and then some of the other um, cyber tech schools um, for some of their training squadrons to, to run an experiment with them. Um, so that's, that's on the radar. So, um, but I'm willing to, yeah, work with, work with anybody to try to, try to hit that. Training environments are going to be a little different, right? So I would say that the tool is more in, more um, gauged towards an education um, type of thing, where you're talking about you know the big ideas, the big picture. When you're thinking about training, you want very tight you know restrictions on whatever tool. So I think there could be possibility of taking the template of the card games and things like that and the rule set and applying it to a training environment, but with different cards in a way that's gonna focus in on one or two learning objectives. Um, so, you know, there's some, there's definitely more discussion there. And whenever you're thinking about trying to fit the whole world of MDO into a card game, yeah. there's gonna be some complexities that just get lost that aren't gonna, you know, a trainer's gonna look at that and, and might not be that valuable to them. Question. How long does the game last? Yeah, so um, the ideal would be about 30 minutes. So I had some play testers that were, that were looking at it a couple weeks ago, and seriously, these guys played for three and a half hours. Going, I'm like, guys, it's not really what it, it meant, it's meant to do. Um, so, you know, if that was a concern, um, so I, with the experiments, I say four hours of interaction with the card game to really get a handle on what's going on. And that's from the very first opening the box, reading the instructions, all the way through till playing a few games and then doing the debrief and discussion uh, part of that. Because that's such an important part of these serious games. Yeah. You don't just play it and then everybody goes home. You, you talk about the experiences that the different players had and try to draw out the real world implications of those things. Uh, so that debrief discussion on the back end is a very important part, especially when you get about a classroom. So that, yeah, that four hours. I think it's, yeah, is it only 1v1 one one or is it, can you make it multiplayer? It is 1v1. One one. The way I do um, is when people are first learning it, they have a strategy partner that they're going to look at the cards together with them, think through it together, talk, bounce different strategies off of one another, and then play a demo game where they play each other um, and they, you know, see how their strategy fares kind of thing. And then they go and play the opponent, which is just another person in the classroom. Yeah, so probably for future research, but in uh, the mid-90s, I got to go check out uh, Virginia Tech's ROTC unit, and they were a colonel that was ahead of that unit that created a flight simulator, you know, aggressor versus Air Force, you know, red, blue, and then uh, built an Excel-based palm process, so you had to palm uh -huh. what your war fighting assets were that you were going to take into the fight. That would be good. Fight. So, you know, I'm playing maybe more off the 
one from the one v one, but you actually then have to build your units mm -hmm. as you go into that strategy. So yeah, so that's good. Something for like a really future good. researcher for the next thesis. That sounds very similar to something the thirteen Oscar um, instructors pointed out. It's like, hey, we could use like really use this for planning and like even authorization of different cyber you know right. weapon systems and things like that. Where now you're having to go and make it a, make a case to you know whoever to use the card in in your game. Exactly. So that's a little more um, long term, which could be um, a good application of this. You give a deck to all the students on day one, and then you use it for this learning objective. You know the second week and this learning objective the fourth week, and then you know in the end you build up to a complete strategy. It's very similar to what Dr. Riley is doing. He says, okay, we're just going to focus on ground. We're just going to focus on maritime. And then they're building the students up to bring it all together at the end. Great learning strategy. Mm -hmm. Anything else? All right.